Well, with a view to uh, God's help, let's uh, turn to the uh, last passage that we read there in the letter to the Philippians and chapter 3 and the opening words of verse 20. Philippians 3, verse 20, where we read that our citizenship is in heaven. For our citizenship is in heaven. And uh, really, in considering uh, these words, we're turning to something that we touched on uh, last Sabbath morning, and that is the theme of uh, citizenship, the idea of belonging to a city or to a nation state. Uh, Normally, now, we think of a citizen as belonging to a nation. Originally, amongst the Greeks, uh, a citizen was somebody who belonged to a particular city. Now, of course, citizenship is an an important thing. Um, Some people recognize that, and some people, of course, uh, glory in it. And I'm sure you're conscious, perhaps, of certain countries um, in which it's true that the people who belong to these countries really glory in these countries, and they're very much proud of the flag that belongs to that country. Perhaps they even go so far as to have it on show on their own home or on their own property. Now, that was particularly true of the residents of Philippi, or as we call them, the Philippians. And there was a special reason why they were such proud uh, patriots in that city. Uh, Historically, the Philippians were a, a Greek people, The city of Philippi received its name from the Macedonian king Philip II, who was the father of Alexander the Great. So it was called a Philippi from that time onwards. But in 42 BC, just a little over a hundred years before this letter was written, 42 BC, Philippi took the right side in a particularly important battle. Now, I don't know if they were aware that they were taking the right side. By the right side, I mean here the victor side. Of course, the victor side isn't always the right side. But in any case, they took the right side from that perspective. And the result was that the man who became the emperor in Rome, that's Augustus, actually transferred a a special privilege on the city of Philippi. And it was an extraordinarily great privilege that he conferred because the city actually became a colony. Now, a colony is a particular uh, kind of status. What it effectively means is that um, a piece of the homeland exists on foreign soil. If you lived in Philippi, it was as good as living in Rome. That's what the status of a colony gave you. So the king, of course, was your emperor. Uh, Caesar is lord. I was going to mention this, I think it was this morning itself, but there's an expression that's used, this is really by the way, but it's used quite often in the New Testament, Jesus is lord. Jesus is lord... uh, is as much a political statement as a theological one. What people were often compelled to say was that Caesar is Lord. By saying that Jesus is Lord, well, you were confessing Christ, and quite possibly the outcome of that would be death. But in Philippi, they were proud to proclaim that Caesar was their Lord. Their laws were Roman laws, That came with all the privileges and the protections of Roman law, and there was no tax to be paid of any kind at all. There's no surprise that uh, in Paul's day, the city of Philippi was full of retired Roman people, especially uh, soldiers and generals who had fought in wars, who were given free land and never paid any taxes. And although this city was located in Greece, it was effectively Rome, and it thought of itself as Roman. They spoke Latin, they dressed 
like Romans, and their pastime. Pastimes were Roman pastimes. Now, of course, the Apostle Paul, in his letters, very often refers to the situations and customs uh, that prevailed in the localities that he was writing to. A a very good and well-known example of that is one I mentioned recently in connection with the Olympic Games, which he refers to in his letter to the Corinthians. Now, the Olympic Games in Corinth had, by Paul's time, become more important than the original ones in Athens. But when Paul writes his letter, he's not afraid to make reference to the fact that there was boxing there and there was running there and so on. He alludes to these things in his letter. So it's no surprise, I suppose, that Paul takes the prevailing distinctive thing in connection with Philippi and makes a reference to it in this letter. You who are such proud citizens of Philippi, our citizenship, he says, is in heaven. So he refers to citizenship. And in so doing, as we'll see in a minute, he refers to the importance of patriotism too. Now on the face of the text, I mean just taking it on first reading, it sounds as though he's only talking about one citizenship. Our citizenship is in heaven. But if you look closely at the verses, you'll see that he's actually contrasting two citizenships. The emphasis is on our. Our citizenship is in heaven because there is another citizenship that many people in Philippi glory in. But the two citizenships that Paul is contrasting are as follows. One is, of course, the heavenly citizenship which Christians have. He has it. And all who belong to the Lord Jesus Christ are heavenly citizens. We belong to that city. We belong to that country. The other citizenship that he refers to it is, a, is a citizenship on earth Not to any particular city on the earth, because at the end of the day, they're all the same. The word cosmopolitan means a citizen of the world. Some people delight in referring to themselves as a citizen of the world. And we live in a day when people don't really, well, many people don't like borders. They don't like the idea of nationhood, although nations are here to stay and will be here till the end of time, as the Bible tells us. But they don't like nationhood, they don't like walls, they don't like separation, so they like to think of themselves as belonging to no locality in particular. I am a citizen of the world. The world is mine, and I belong to the world. Where well, these are the two citizenships that the apostle is contrasting here. And really, I suppose, if you were to think of that kind of cosmopolitan citizenship, There's a way in which you could say that the citizenship is really a sense of belonging to Babylon, which is in effect what every city of the world really is. Unless the Lord has come into the city, unless the Lord has taken over the city, unless that city on the earth becomes a colony of gods in this world, then it will be in the shape and in the mold of Babylon itself. And you'll see really that these two citizenships are being contrasted here because he talks about the enemies of the cross in verse 18. He describes them in verse 19 as those whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, and who set their mind on earthly things. These are the citizens of the earth. For our citizenship, in contrast with all that, is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Saviour. Now, I'm sure you'll understand from all that right away that there really are only two citizenships in the world. In the spiritual sense, that is. There's lots of citizenships, naturally speaking, but spiritually speaking, there are only two citizenships, and you do, in fact, belong to to one of them. Uh, You have been born a citizen of this world. Some of you have been reborn to be citizens of another world. But one way or another, all of you, all of us, belong to one of these cities. 
we are either cosmopolitan or we are citizens of a heavenly country and a heavenly heavenly city. And as I mentioned, I think it was, maybe it was Thursday, I can't remember, or last Sabbath morning, you can't be citizens of both. There's no such thing as a dual citizenship. Now, some people may try to claim a dual citizenship. It's possible to apply for a citizenship in heaven, while all the time you are determined to hang on to a citizenship on the earth. I know some people who want a second citizenship, but they don't want to let go of the citizenship that they have. Uh, Now, of course, it's quite possible in this world to have a dual citizenship, but not in the spiritual world, although some think that you can, but you can't, and we'll see that as we go on. Now, let's look, with God's help, at both these citizenships, and may the Lord help us to understand which city we belong to. Um, There are clear ways of identifying that, and let's pay particular attention at the close to what happens to both these cities and the citizens of both cities. We saw that in our readings, the destruction of Babylon and the everlasting blessedness of the new Jerusalem. But let's see who belongs to which city. Let's begin with the citizens of the world. Now, citizens of the world have a king. And I suppose if you or if I was writing this, we might make the king of this world to be Satan himself. Um, And, of course, there's a way in which we can say that. He's described as the God of this world. Although I don't think that that statement is really giving him that status, I think that statement is telling us how the world views him. The world acknowledges him as their God. Now, again, in saying that, that doesn't mean that they're Satan worshippers. It just means that they copy um, his characteristics of life. In other words, he chooses to live his life in rebellion against God and the citizens of the world make the same choice. So in that respect, he is their God. They are following his example. He's the one who first sinned. He's the one who was instrumental in, first of all, bringing sin into the human race, into your spiritual veins and mine. Therefore, by following him, We are following the God of this world. But it's interesting that Paul doesn't refer to the God of this world as the devil here. He refers to their God as their belly in verse 19. The citizens of the earth were told of them that their God is their belly. Now, the Greek word for belly is the word koilos, from which you get colon. It actually means an empty space. An empty space. And the reason that in itself is significant is because the belly is here represented as something that is craving all the time. It represents our desires, our appetites, and our cravings in every natural direction. That can be an intellectual craving for knowledge, It can be the craving for fame, applause, and popularity. It can be the craving for food and drink and clothing. The craving for the pride of this life, as John calls it, or indeed a craving for sexual satisfaction in increasingly diverse ways. And I suppose it's fitting that that be described as a belly, as something with a a hole at its centre because it's never filled really. It's never satisfied. The sad thing about the citizens of this world is that they are perpetually unsatisfied, forever unsatisfied. And I wonder, friend, if you can recognise yourself even in that, that you are just not satisfied. And it doesn't matter how you try to fill your belly You're never satisfied. You're never full. There is a reason for that. The reason for that is because you were made for higher things. And until you find that, you will never ever be 
satisfied. So the citizens of this world serve the belly. Their constitution is liberty, freedom. I suppose the devil, <clears throat> in a sense, promised knowledge to Eve at first. But even underlying that was the, the idea that she should be free. And you'll notice how clever the devil was in trying to plant in Eve's mind the idea that she was actually restricted, that God had restricted her. Has God said that you shall not eat of every tree? Strange way of putting that. It would be far better, of course, to say that God has given you every single tree except one. But he just focuses on the restriction. Is it the case, he says, that God has not allowed you every tree? Well, of course, that was true. And it carries the idea that she's bound. She's fettered. That God is a God of bondage. That God, the God is a God who restricts. He's not a God of freedom. No, he's a God of bondage. And that's why the citizens of the world have as a fundamental part of their creed that they be absolutely free. Individual freedom trumps everything else and all restrictions are unwelcome. And that includes the strange kind of freedoms that we see now where people believe that they should be free to be, well, anything they like. Really, anything they like. I was going to say to choose their sex or their gender, but it's to choose their identity, period. Now, of course, the French Revolution was a cataclysmic event in Europe, and indeed its shockwaves went right throughout the world. But at the heart of the French Revolution was an overthrow of religion, now, I'm conscious that it ended up being the overthrow of a very debased form of religion in the form of the Catholic Church and its tyranny and so on. But leaving that to the side, right at the heart of it, was an overthrow of the authority of God in every shape or form. It even went to the extent that in the French Revolution they tried to change the week from a seven-day week to a ten-day week. The only reason for that is because a seven-day week is in the Word of God. They want to change everything, of course, Ten-day week didn't work because that's not how God designed us. But most of you will know that the watchword or the watchwords of the French Revolution were liberty, equality, and fraternity. Liberty, equality, and fraternity. Which, of course, was all very well until they started disagreeing with each other and going to war with each other and hating each other. And, of course, the French Revolution began with a bloodbath of those who were for the old order, but it ended up swiftly being with a bloodbath amongst those who disagreed with each other about that liberty and that fraternity and that equality. And it's no accident, friends, that the most ruthless and tyrannous states in the 20th century were those who had no room for God in their constitutions. That's just a fact. You look at the nations that initiated bloodbaths in the 20th century and you'll find that they had no God in their hearts. But individual liberty and equality can't coexist. For example, your right, supposedly, to be known by another gender places a duty on me to recognize that gender. But that means that I lose my liberty, and of course, bang goes our fraternity. Liberty and equality can't coexist. That's why you have this clash between feminism and the trans ideology. Humanism, friends, always ends up eating itself. Anti-Christianity always ends up eating itself. Anything that doesn't acknowledge the word of God and truth will eventually collapse in a clash of false ideas and in a clash of lies, all of which should expose the fact that we are building Babylon 
rather than building New Jerusalem. As I mentioned to you, I think it was last week, uh, Babylon is Babel, which is confusion. The city of confusion, what man always builds. So that's the constitution. Since their God is their belly, their constitution is individual liberty. Let me live as I please. And then, of course, they have a national mindset. A national mindset. Now, there is such a thing as a a national mindset. Here we're told in verse 19 that the people who are citizens of the earth are setting their mind on earthly things. People speak of a German mindset, British mindset, an American mindset, and so it goes on. Well, the citizens of the world set their mind on earthly things. That means that their focus is on the world. They, they, they don't look up any higher than that. This is where we are. This is our home. And that's why the Lord describes them as people who are constantly asking, what shall we eat and what shall we drink and what shall we wear? They're materialistic. After all, they believe that all there is in the universe is matter, so why not be materialistic? They're absorbed in the world. They're absorbed in the things that the world can give them. They're entertained by the things that the world provides. And their heroes and celebrities are definitely not Christians. The most strange people become celebrities in the world today, the further it drifts away from God. So there's a national mindset. You're focusing on the world. And, of course, because you have a national mindset that focuses on the earth, there is a national way of living too. People can recognize you. You can normally recognize nationalities by the way people speak, by the way they dress, and the way they live their lives. These things appear in very strange ways. Um, I remember someone once um, who visited Germany and said, if you're going to cross the road, he said, it it doesn't matter. Suppose there was no car there. Everybody will wait for the light to go before you cross. You know straight away you're in Germany. Things that mark people out. Well, every citizen of the world is marked out. Marked out by speech. They don't have the language of Canaan. They have the language of this world. Careless language. Ungodly language. They're not afraid to take the name of the Lord in vain. They do it in flippant ways, maybe many times a day. Unclean language. Paul rebukes, of course, all kinds of language that are wrong, particularly blasphemous language, but he also rebukes unclean language. Uh, Some people sometimes ask, well, what's wrong with these words, really? Well, the fact that the Bible calls them unclean tells you what's wrong with them. You'll notice that an awful lot of what we call swear words, which are not really swear words, technically speaking, but a lot of the language that we use as filler language has references to sexuality, sometimes to gross sexuality. And people put a, an adjective or a, or a verb or something like that that has nothing to do with, with what's being said, nothing to do with it, but here it comes from this world of fallen man seeking his own pleasure apart from God and they import it into their sentences all the time. And the apostle says, let no unclean language come out of your mouth. Now, that is a direct biblical reference to using expressions like that. The Christian is not just careful to avoid speech that um, attacks God or his glory or takes his name in vain, but he is careful and she is careful to use speech that is not unclean. Innuendo, smut, that kind of thing. Christian shouldn't delight in it, and a Christian shouldn't be participating in it when these things are broadcast by way of programs. I mean, that's not our humor. That's not how we're entertained. Laughter has its place, and humor is itself a gift, but not in those ways. And the scripture is quite clear in that. So there's a certain kind of speech that the world adopts. It's careless, it's ungodly, and it's unclean. There's a national dress, too. Now, you're familiar with national dress. Immediately, I speak about a Scotsman. You can conceive of a Scotsman. 
however close that national dress is, to how they appear day to day, it doesn't matter. The fact of the matter is that a citizen of the world has a national dress. And again, the more the citizen of the world moves away from the true God of this world, the more awful that dress becomes. People dress to provoke towards sexuality. They dress to allure. And the world has no sympathy, no concept with the idea of modesty. Now, the word of God commands men and women, to dress modestly. I think we should all know what that means. I suppose we can go into it some other time, but for now, it's enough to say that the world doesn't care about that. It doesn't care about it. It's quite happy to flaunt these things. And last of all, they're simply a national conduct, a way of life. And the best way to describe it is by describing what it isn't. It's not keeping the Ten Commandments. And it has no respect for the Ten Commandments, which are God's way of life. Now, most of these citizens of this world, and if you're a citizen of this world, this may be true of you, and it is true of you to one degree or another. Um, Every citizen of this world is patriotic, Sometimes enthusiastically so. Unless the Lord wakes you up to realize what an awful country you're living in. Um, in that connection, it was interesting to see. You can, st- you can see snippets of film of some Germans, uh, men and women, who were being shown around the concentration camps uh, after they were liberated. And y- you can still see them going into these camps uh, quite wide-eyed and innocent because they, they weren't willing to believe uh, what their country was actually up to. And they come out of these concentration camps utterly shell-shocked, utterly shell-shocked at the country that they belong to. And it may be the case that God will waken you up to recognize the nature of the world in which we glory in, in which you glory. I shouldn't have said we there because I don't. But to wake you up to the country that maybe you're glorying in and the country that you're happy to be in. I don't mean the UK by that. I mean this world as it exists without God. Paul tells us that it's true of the citizens of the earth that they glory in their shame. You'll notice that their God is their belly. They set their mind therefore on earthly things and their glory is in their shame. That doesn't mean that they're ashamed, far from it. What that expression means is that they are boasting in the things that they should be ashamed of. They're boasting in the things they should be ashamed of. Jeremiah had to say to Israel uh, long ago, in connection with the kind of abominations that they were guilty of, and where there was widespread uh, adultery and all these things and Sabbath breaking and everything, were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? No, Jeremiah says, they were not ashamed. They did not know how to blush. They didn't know how to blush. They didn't know how to be ashamed. Or as Paul says <coughs> to the Romans, Describing again the the terrible outbreak of sin where people are filled with, now this is a long list, but it's a long list for a reason. I mean, Paul could have summed it all up in two or three words, but he said a declining civilization that's turning away from God is filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, inventing evil things, as though there there wasn't enough, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unliving, unloving, unforgiving, and unmerciful. And although they know God's righteous judgments, that those who live like that are deserving of death, 
they not only do the same things themselves, but approve of other people who practice them. One of the most glaring examples of that in our own generation is what's known as pride. A strange name. Whichever way you take it. You can think of pride as simply a sin, because pride is a sin, is it not? If I was proud, you'd say I was sinful. Or if you think of it the other way, as being proud of what you're doing, a strange name too. Pride. A whole month dedicated to pride. Although it's a very long month. And of course there's also the insistence, increasingly, that children become a part of it. Or at least that they witness it. I saw a a glimpse of it some time ago uh, on the news, I think, or on a program where people were just flaunting themselves um, to children who were by the roadside um, in the most remarkable ways, just incredible ways. Parents sometimes with the children watching that. Pride. And, of course, they appropriate the rainbow, which is, again, a a solemn thought. If you wonder why God doesn't pour out his wrath on such things as that, such obvious, um, blatant and proud uh, defiance of his law and the lifestyle that he gives, if you wonder why God doesn't pour out his wrath on it, it's actually got to do with the rainbow. Uh, Many of you will know that um, at a certain point God instituted the rainbow to be a sign of his covenant with this world. And that was a covenant that said, uh, God said that he would not pour out his wrath in a cosmic way on this world like he did on the flood. He said, I will not do that again. I I will not pour out a cosmic wrath on this world again until the last day comes when the world will be consumed not this time with water but by fire in other words the rainbow every time we see it and it's worth remembering this I was talking in my prayer about the importance of anticipating the sacraments and recognizing um, when we look at the table what the bread speaks about and what the wine speaks about But the fact of the matter is that all God's covenants are like that, including the covenant with the earth. And every single time you see a rainbow, it's not a reason to say, oh, look, there's a rainbow. It's a reason to remember the covenant that God has made. And the rainbow's message is essentially this, that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And in that kind of way, it is, there's almost, don't misunderstand me, but there's almost an appropriateness to it. Um, In one way, of course, certainly not. But in another way, it's a reminder to us that the only reason God is not intervening here is because he is slow to wrath, and he is plenteous in mercy, and he is not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. Uh, And when you look at such things and wonder how God does not intervene, you see the flag. And strangely enough, the flag tells you that God is not intervening because he is still merciful. And these patriots too, as well as being proud of their shame, they are also deeply opposed to the cross of Christ. We're told in verse 18 that they are the enemies of the cross. Now, um, Paul is sorry to say that some of these were people who walked with them, with themselves at one point. Some walk, he says, of whom I tell you now, even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Now, that is not just his general weeping for the lost, which is an important thing, and which we can't afford to lose ourselves. Even in the midst of all that and the provocation of all that, we should weep too because these are people who are lost and they are heading into a deeper condition of lostness and there's a weeping in connection with that. 
that ought to be. But this particular weeping that the Apostle speaks of has, has reference to those who once walked with themselves, but now have renounced the cross and have actually become enemies of the cross of Christ. Why are they enemies of the cross? Well, because it's a Christian symbol and they hate it. You'll notice how, how there's opposition even to little crosses that people wear. I'm not commenting just now on the fact that people wear it, but you'll notice the opposition to it. They don't like it. The cross is a symbol of God and of God's sovereignty in the world and God's plan of redemption and what God calls sin and what God calls righteousness and they are deeply opposed to it. Now who has this citizenship? Well, sad to say, friends, everybody's got it. If we're born into this world, We are citizens of this world, unless something happens to change that. But there is another citizenship. And that's what he means when he says, our citizenship is in heaven. There's another country. There's another city in that country. The country is the heavenly country of Hebrews 11 that we saw last Sabbath morning. And the city, of course, is the new Jerusalem itself. This country is outside of this visible universe. It is the heaven of heavens. It is the third heaven in which the Lord himself dwells. And it's dominated by a large city, which is itself dominated by the very presence of God in his glory and in his splendor. And he has built this city, and he's populating this city, as we saw last Sabbath, Its maker and its builder is God. Now the king of this city, well, the God of this city was the belly, but the God of this city is the Lord Jesus Christ, who is reigning, even now, today, from heaven. And the scepter that he stretches out from heaven is reaching right down here to the earth. That, of course, explains Psalm 2. Psalm 2 doesn't like it doesn't like the intrusion of this country into this country. The citizens of this country think they own it. They think they have the right to regulate and to rule it. In fact, they think that Christians are interfering in the right government of this country. And they don't like the scepter of the Lord being stretched out from heaven onto the earth. But of course, the Lord Jesus Christ's kingdom is not of this world. It doesn't have its origin here. It's actually in here all right. It's in the world all right. But it doesn't originate there because he himself doesn't originate there. Our king is from heaven and our king tonight is in heaven. What's the constitution of this kingdom? Well, every country or city has its constitution. Roman law for the Romans, English common law for the English, Scots law for the Scots. What's the law of Christ's kingdom? The law of Christ. It is indeed the Ten Commandments. And these commandments are commandments that all the citizens of heaven love. God has placed a love for these commandments in the heart, and all those who belong to the heavenly city strive to keep these commandments. Oh, how I love thy law. It is my study all the day. It makes me wiser than my foes, for it doth with me stay. And these are the laws and precepts that guide our steps at all times. And if an authority in this world comes along and says, well, you can't do that, including, for example, disciplining your child, you say, I have another king. I'm sorry, but I have another king. And this is the king that I serve faithfully. And one mark of a heavenly citizen is a love for the law of God and a desire to conform to it. There is, of course, a heavenly mindset too. Just as there's an earthly mindset that is obsessed with eating and drinking and clothes and so on, so there's a heavenly mindset. 
Paul says to the Colossians in chapter 3 and verse 2, he says, don't set your affection on the things which are below, he says, but set your minds on the things which are above, where Christ sits at the right hand of God. That's where the Christian's mindset is. Not here, but there. How do we set our mind on heavenly things? Well, first of all, by setting our mind on the heavenly man himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. He who sits himself at the right hand of God. His pre-existence. His eternal love, which was going forth towards us before the world itself ever began. His miraculous birth, his teaching and life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension into heaven, his session at the right hand of God, and the ongoing miraculous work of the Holy Spirit, which brings the work of heaven into this earthly domain. Set your mind on the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Again, set your mind on his heavenly call on you. A call to exercise faith in him. And a call to exercise holiness of life. You set your mind on that. You start thinking about how it is that the Lord Jesus Christ wants you to live. For example, again, in the letter to the Colossians, as the elect of God, heavenly citizens, put on tender mercy. Think about that. That's a lot in itself. Put on kindness, even to your enemies. Humility. Meekness. Long-suffering. Bear with one another. Forgive one another, even as Christ forgave you, so also you must do. And over and above all these garments, he says, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God, this heavenly peace from this heavenly man, let it rule in your hearts, to which you were called in one body. You think on your heavenly calling or even as Paul says to the Philippians here and we thought about this very recently at a prayer meeting he says think on these things he says the things that are true noble just pure lovely and of good report anything virtuous and praiseworthy meditate on these things these are the things he says which you learned and received And you heard and saw in me, do these, and the God of peace will be with you. So you think of the heavenly Christ, your king, and the heavenly call that he has on your life, which is to be like himself, which leads you, last of all, to think of your heavenly home. Um, You've never been. You've never been. You were born away from home. Um, You were born away from the land to which you belong. But if you make an effort to think about it, you'll find yourself drawn to it. And And the longer you live, the more it's like that. Bunyan, of course, represents Christian as he's nearing the celestial city. When he catches a glimpse of it, he begins to faint at the side. Uh, That's a wonderful thought. One thing that helps us to think of heaven is to think of the people who have gone there. I remember, I don't know if I mentioned to you before, but uh, Moody recalls as a a young boy how he used to think of heaven as buildings uh, with gleaming spires, white buildings with gleaming spires. And then he says as he got a bit older, his brother died, who was a bright Christian, and he realized that he knew one person in heaven. And then the longer he lived, the more he knew who were dying, who were Christian people. And he then said, as I got older, I realized that heaven was full of people, not buildings. And that's a wonderful thing. And I was talking to a couple of the brethren today who are, shall we say, more advanced in years than I am. 
And I was saying to them the number of people that they must know and must have known who have gone home to glory. There's something in that that quickens your own steps heavenward. Not just the Lord of glory himself being there, which is, of course, the greatest thing of all, but all his people too. When you think of that place so full of purity and glory and fellowship, when you think of it so full of uh, gladness and joy, when you think of it so utterly devoid and absent of sin and sorrow and sighing, regret and remorse and pain, well, who wouldn't want to be there? And as you think of it, you're drawn to it. I mentioned that last Sabbath morning when it spoke of all the patriarchs who left their comforts. If if they had a mind to return, they would have returned. But now they seek a better country, a heavenly country. And God is not ashamed to be called their God. And because these citizens have a heavenly mindset, that means that they have a heavenly walk as well. Now, um, that, that's pretty much the opposite. I don't need to go on about it, but it's the opposite of what I said belongs to the citizens of this earth. For example, their speech changes. My speech changed when I became a Christian. Maybe yours needs to change too. Maybe even listening to yourself speak would be a shock to you. Uh, some of you will remember the Watergate scandal in which uh, President Nixon was involved, a Republican president in 1974. And... Uh, he was, a cl- was claiming, of course, that he was innocent of the charges against him, which was plotting and planning certain things. But he had forgotten that everything he said in the White House was taped. And these tapes were played back to him. And, you know, um, Nixon, Nixon said that what shocked him the most was uh, his language, how foul his language was. He didn't really realise it until it was played back to him on tape. I wonder how many things will shock us about our own lives when they're replayed back on the Day of Judgment. And replayed they will be. Wonder how many things may shock us about how we spoke and how we thought and how we conducted ourselves in this life. You need a saviour, my friend. I need a saviour. We all need a saviour. But a Christian speech changes. Your speech is seasoned with salt. Instead of these unclean adjectives, in come descriptive adjectives. We begin to speak as God intended us to speak. Our clothing is the same. That sobers up and it becomes modest. And of course, our whole life is a conforming to the life that the Lord would have us live. Now, who belongs to this country and city? Well, it's very simple. Once born means you're a citizen of this world. Twice born, you're a citizen of that world. In fact, when when Christ says to Nicodemus, you must be born again, literally in the Greek language, that's you must be born from above. You must have a second birth, and it must be from above. The heavenly spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ, notice, notice how it's all heaven coming down. The heavenly spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ comes into your worldly heart and makes you a new creature and invests you with a new citizenship. And you are no longer the person you were before. The old man has died. The old woman has died. You're a new you. That truth is so stupendous that... Um, We should think about it every day. You are heavenly. You are heavenly. The spirit that governs you is a spirit from heaven that is conforming you into the image of the heavenly man. Isn't that a wonderful thing? You're a twice-born person. There are two consequences following from that. The first is, as I mentioned last Sabbath, that you're a stranger and a pilgrim here. These words appear, I think, three times in the scriptures, maybe four. A stranger, you remember, is somebody who doesn't belong. A pilgrim is somebody who's just passing through. Uh, Joseph, I'm sure, thought of himself in Egypt like that. I'm a stranger here, and I'm just passing through. That's why he wanted to be buried in Canaan when he died. 
You can say as a Christian here today, I'm a stranger in this world. You sometimes feel it. You really feel it sometimes. And uh, praise God, he brings you into situations where if you're starting to feel a little comfortable, it's amazing how he isolates you. Using word and providence, he isolates you and you say, I'm a stranger and I'm just passing through. And of course, I'm going home. These are all wonderful feelings to have. That means, of course, and this takes us round full circle, it means that the church to which you know, and I don't mean the, the RP church, I mean the Church of Christ. The Church of Christ to which you belong now is a colony. What do I mean by a colony? Well, the same thing I meant when I described Philippi as a colony. Philippi was effectively a slice of Rome in Greece. That's what the Church of Christ is. It is a bit of heaven planted in this world, governed by Christ, governed by his laws, filled with his people who are just demarcated and separated out from the rest. If Philippi is a bit of Rome in Greece, the Church of Christ is a bit of heaven on earth, and we strive to make it so. Let's be heavenly minded. Let's be heavenly in our speech. Let's pray that even amongst ourselves as the people of God, that God's will would be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Let the colony be faithful as the original city is faithful. Pray the same for our towns and villages. Someone, a Scotsman, once passing through Calvin's Geneva said that he felt that there was no place on earth like it outside of heaven. So full it was of God's presence and God's power. Last of all, and very briefly, you'll notice that these two countries have a very different destination. The earthly city will one day be destroyed and the citizens cast into the lake of fire. Uh, You you can't escape the destination of your city. You, You just fall with it. If you insist on remaining in the city of destruction, when it is destroyed, so are you. But the heavenly country and the heavenly city is very different. You you saw its destination there in Revelation 21. Down it comes. God, God creates a new universe, a new heaven and a new earth. And down from heaven in all her glory comes this city. Ready for God to dwell in it. And the veil between heaven and earth is taken away. And it's as though everything at last is heaven. And the citizens, well, the interesting thing is that when the king comes back, uh, they know that they're going home. Unbelievers who are alive when the king appears, they start praying at last, but in the wrong direction and for the wrong things. They start praying that the hills would fall upon them and that the mountains would cover them. But... The Lord's people recognize that Christ is coming to take them home. And the marvelous thing is that as he descends and as they ascend, he reconstitutes their bodies using the same DNA so that they're all the same as who they were before. But he raises these bodies and transforms them in the very act into the likeness of his glorious body. And they know before they arrive in glory that that's their destination. They look like the people at last who belong to that city. You can't enter it without absolute purity, and absolutely pure they are when they enter the doors of that city, in the likeness of his glorious body, and so we shall forever be with the Lord. Now, let me just close by saying this. I don't know about you and about patriotism, but I thank the Lord that I can say from my heart tonight that I am proud of my country, and I'm not talking about Scotland or the UK. I'm proud of my king, I'm proud of God's rainbow, and I'm proud of God's cross. And I'm not going to plead with you to apply for dual citizenship, because if there's something about this city and country that you like and you want to be a part of, well, there's no dual citizenship. But what I would ask you to do is to apply for citizenship of this country. 
and you apply by asking God to receive you into it. And God will receive you into it. He'll give you a certificate, which is his own promise, and he'll seal that certificate with his own Holy Spirit. And you'll have that certificate forevermore. And some people joined the church today by disjunction certificate, uh, which is a right and proper thing when we move from one part of the vineyard to another. But uh, there's one disjunction certificate that we all await, and that's the one that God issues. Of course, a disjunction certificate is one that disjoins. That's why it's called a disjunction. And the disjunction that we await is the one that disjoins us from the colony here and actually takes us home to the fatherland, where God is so far. It's a sad thing about the word fatherland that it's actually been a bit debased because of what happened in Nazi Germany and their reference to the fatherland. But it's actually a biblical word. And it reminds us that the land we're going to is the land of our father. And the home we're going to is the home of our father with our elder brother and the rest of our brothers and our sisters. And there we go to be forever with the Lord. Now isn't that a better citizenship to have? Let's call on the name of the Lord. Eternal One, we uh, bless your name this evening, that uh, a citizenship is open to us all. In the psalm that we sang, the people who came from Babylon and from Egypt and from Ethiopia, all came from lands that were shrouded in darkness. And some of these lands were in bitter opposition to the people of God, but yet they were enrolled in Zion. And we pray for those tonight who may be glorying in what they should be ashamed of and pray that they would find a citizenship, even as we have found it. And we ask your blessing upon the word. May it be effective and fruitful in our own lives until we are disjoined from here to there. In the precious name of Christ, O Lord. Amen.